Good afternoon, uh, Dr. James Cole. Good afternoon, Mark. Thanks <laughs> Good for afternoon. having me. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here on Meet the Archaeologist. Now, um, first of all, could you possibly just introduce yourself uh, to the boys and girls at home? Yeah, sure. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's James, uh, and I am a, a senior lecturer here at the University of Brighton in archaeology, um, and specifically the type of archaeology that I research and, and, and enjoy and, and, and learn and teach here is about human evolution, so how we evolved from our earliest hominin ancestors about 11 million years ago until the emergence of our own species almost 200,000 years ago. Excellent, excellent. So, so, so in, in some ways, actually, you, uh, you're sort of the, uh, the archaeologist slash anthropologist who, who um, I suppose, proves the rule by breaking it in so much as you, you very much di uh, aren't what many people would class as being an archaeologist. You're looking at, at pre-homo sapiens uh, archaeology. Um, how, did, did you ever find that, that there's a bit of sort of you know, gentle ripping between humans and, and human evolution uh, specialists? Oh, uh, it's rife, actually. <laughs> uh, we do that all the time. Um, it's quite interesting. I was uh, at a meeting yesterday, and we were sort of just talking a little bit about this issue and how we sort of need to, we as, as we, we sort of call ourselves Paleolithic archaeologists because we're mm. interested in stone tools, need to be better at kind of communicating to other disciplines, Romanists and things like that. So rather than just, you know, I, I jokingly say to my students, oh, you know, once we get to that period, it's all boring because we, we know all about it. Um, which, of course, we don't. And there's a gross oversimplification and yeah. a disservice yeah. to my colleagues. Um, but equally, they will say, well, you, you don't want to be interested in that old stuff because it's all monkey rocks and bashing things together. Which uh -huh. of, of course, it is. But there is, uh, I think, a, a friendly rivalry uh, will exist between us who study that human evolution period mm -hmm. and, and those of, of later prehistoric and historic uh, periods. But, you know, fundamentally, we're all interested in the same thing and mm -hmm. we all ask the same sorts of questions. And that is, what do people do in the past? Mm -hmm. How did they do them? And why did they do them? Mm. And I think those three questions are applicable across the whole spectrum, um, but, yeah, without, which is great. Absolutely, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm you know, very much uh, being very tongue-in-cheek there. But it, I think it's an interesting question because when, when most people uh, ask for a definition of archaeology, I tend to talk about basically the last 200,000 years. Um, so, okay. so, so actually, you're the first person that we've had in these interviews who is an evolutionary specialist. So, um, oh, amazing! Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> now, on that on that note, is there anything in particular that you that you are uh, particularly interested in? Is it is it morphology? Is it tools? Is it uh, ge yeah the the geography of where our ancestors lived? Yeah, so uh, a lot of my research looks at what I'm really interested in is sort of when do we start using material culture, so the objects that we make to say uh, something more than just being a functional tool. So, mm -hmm. you know, in modern day life, we do it all the time with the way that we dress, the mm -hmm. jewelry you might wear, the car you might drive. It says something about you to the outside world. And that can be very conscious. You, you construct that image and you, and you send it out. It can be unconscious too. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in, well, when does that first appear in the archaeological record mm -hmm. um, and for the for sort of um, a, a, a record of material culture I mean that goes back almost 3.3 million years now that's when the oldest stone tools have been found mm. no doubt even beyond that so there must be a point in that evolutionary development of very functionally driven objects that are used to maybe butcher carcasses access the marrow in the zebra leg or whatever it is that you're dealing with to objects that are functional, but also say something about us. Mm, mm. Um, so for me, that's often linked to a particular type of object called a hand axe. Mm -hmm. uh, and a hand axe is sort of uh, a stone tool that's, that's deliberately shaped and fashioned into uh, sometimes a bit of a pointy object. I actually just have one here, just in case as a useful guide. Uh, um, so it's deliberately shaped and fashioned on two faces and, you know, it's, some are pointy, some are rounded and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's 
often traditionally thought that once we start to impose shape and form deliberately onto an object, maybe we can use that to say something about ourselves. Okay. So sort of putting the culture back into uh, material culture from that, that era, as opposed to just being tools, as you say. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And okay. sometimes you know, we have, um, you know, these you know, hand axes are almost 2 million years old. I mm. think the oldest one on record is 1.7 million. And they're made all the way to, you know, 100,000 and, and less. Mm. And we sometimes have uh, amazing artifacts, you know, that are extremely symmetrical. They look very symmetrical. They're shaped. Uh, some are very large. Mm -hmm. uh, in, we, we, the slight misnomer, giant hand axe might be applied. You know, they're 30 or, you know, 40 centimeters big and they're quite heavy and people think well maybe these go beyond function mm. in some mm. maybe they are straying into sculpture almost or just sort of you know people in the past saying something about mm. themselves whether it's look at me i'm really skillful i can make a very large object or i can make an object that's very finely shaped and you know deliberately pattern you know um, formed mm. so i must you know i'm skillful maybe I, it's it's a it's saying something about them as an individual to the group or uh, some people have argued maybe it's about groups just saying things to, you know, doing things in different ways that are guided by culture rather than technology. But I think it's very difficult in those deep periods of time to actually come to a conclusive answer, which is both the joy and the frustration of of, of that, um, that deep archaeology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is something where actually I, I think my... I suppose per personal professional interests um, I certainly have a big overlap with you. So which I'm I'm a prehistorian by by habit, as it were. Okay. Um, you know, I've recently <laughs> come to history, as it were, in the last seven years or so. But but yeah, that 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 that, uh, that mystery is certainly one of the things which I find very very interesting. Um, now um, now you mentioned symmetry of tools, and I seem to recall. This may be a very outdated reference now, but I seem to recall having read a paper, I think by possibly Chris Stringer, talking about, um, for example, sexual selection based on oh, okay, symmetrical yeah. tools. So almost the idea of, of being able to make an incredibly symmetrical tool translates to how good you are as a potential partner. Uh, is, 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 has, has thinking moved on in the last few years based on this? Uh Yes, I think. Um, I, so I think that's a that was a very useful paper by I think um, Meisen and uh, Kuhn. I forget the the, the first. Sorry, I must have read it in a Stringer book. Then sorry. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's often called the sexy hand axe theory, mm -hmm. um, and it is you're exactly right. You know, the the very well made hand axes, uh, skillfully made, are maybe a form of sexual selection because you know I'm a skilled napper, male or female, therefore. Um, you know, I'll be a, a good partner and mm -hmm. a contributor to the group. And I think what that theory did and what it does do very successfully is in an, a very accessible way show how a stone tool can be a cultural object as well as a functional object. And mm. I think that's the power of that idea. Um, although the, the perhaps the, the caveat is is that we, we meant, you know, it's often mentioned interpretations of hand axes but it's, it's one of a number of possible explanations. Mm. Uh, certainly some of my work has been, and that of uh, an, another colleague, uh, John McNabb at Southampton, has been looking at whether symmetry is actually present in hand axe assemblages. You know, the perception is, the, the common idea is that as our brains increase in size through time, through different species, so the first hand axe makers are Homo erectus, we then have Homo heidelbergensis, uh, maybe Homo antecessor in the later stages as, a, as another hand axe maker, then ourselves emerge in Africa and Neanderthals in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And as those hominins evolve and develop, they get larger in body and bigger in brain. And as our brains get bigger, therefore our ability to engage material culture in a social way or maybe a symbolic way as a message also increases. Mm. And in lockstep in that should you should see an increase in symmetry within the assemblages made by those hominins. Hmm. So for my PhD, I actually looked at a British sample, you know, does, is symmetry present and does it increase in time? Uh, and actually found almost the opposite to be true. Uh, symmetry is present, but it's often in very low percentage values in the assemblage. So in my study, I found almost, you know, less than 10%. In, in, in the 12 or so assemblages that I looked at. 
and actually it didn't increase in time at all it was sort of varied um, randomly through time. And is this potentially therefore linked to the difference between a utilitarian tool and a symmetrical symbol perhaps or socially useful artifact? Wow yes uh, and also maybe it's kind of a bit more linked to our perception of how the past should be in to today as it were you know we as modern humans we like we like to classify things very carefully mm -hmm. and clearly it makes it easy to explain and easy to understand so the idea that you know lots of symmetry and increases through time fits really well with mm. you know, a great way of seeing the past but actually i think we need to embrace the complexity and you know, we as a modern species are complex we're culturally diverse uh, across the world mm -hmm. uh, and we are different and we do things differently and we don't all think the same way and we are complex mm -hmm. uh, and actually, there's probably no reason why other human groups and older human species weren't as complex in their similarities and differences between between their groups. So also, in a sense, tra challenging this sense of a continuous upwards tra trajectory of, of uh, as it were, human development. Now, now actually, in... in um with that in mind, and this is this is this is why I'm glad to have our first evolutionary specialist on, because uh, I, I, have, I have sort of touched on this in my own videos here and there, but it'd be lovely to 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 to, to have someone say you know, a little bit more on it. Um, we frequently today in for, in the media, for, for example, and especially when it comes to talking about the evolution of of, of man, um, we hear things of, like such as or phrases such as "missing link" and all this kind of malarkey. Now, um, I suppose first of all, can you just address this this question of if is there a missing link? I'm pretty sure there isn't. But also, secondly. Um, uh, I suppose, how important do you think it is that the people in 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 the wider world and also in other disciplines start to understand actually where our understanding of human evolution actually is today? Those are good two two good questions. So I think the first one is um, in terms of a missing link, there is no single species or that that would fit that description. I think mm. now we have a much clearer understanding that the way that we've developed over the last seven million years since our split with our last sort of common ancestor with, with primates is much more of a continuum and it's a continuum that involves increasing brain size and increasing bipedality between different species and different genre um, that really culminates in the beginning of our own genus Homo about three million years ago. Mm. Um, and although in, 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 I think evolution is also much more messy than perhaps this kind of um, slightly sort of punctuated thought might be. Um, recent examples in paleogenetics show that we've interbred with other human species like the Neanderthals. So all humans outside of Africa have between 1 and 4% Neanderthal DNA in their makeup. Mm -hmm. Some in Southeast Asia and Polynesia have another few percentiles of another human species called Denisovans. Mm. And, I, and I think what's really sort of interesting for me is that if we're picking that up in the genetic signature, I think what that must mean is that actually that human interaction between different species must be fairly complicated and, and presumably frequent back through the fossil record. So mm. it's not just here's one fossil specimen that demonstrates some sort of missing link between modern human form and what might have looked something like a, a, a chimpanzee seven million years ago. Mm. Um, and in terms of the public perception question, I think absolutely it's really important that they understand and engage with this uh, huge advancement we've had in, in our understanding of human, human evolution, particularly in the last five years. I mean, we've had great advancements. I've already mentioned the paleogenetics. I mean, that's certainly a cutting edge and is providing some wonderful information about how messy human evolution is and how we just obviously like to sleep with other human species. <laughs> and that, that's fine. That's, maybe it's part of our nature. Yeah. Uh, but it shows, you know, that we you know as a, as, a, as a species, Homo sapiens, we are a mix-up of all sorts of different things. So I think it says a lot about, will help our understanding, you know, in the modern world of, you know, differences between cultures and race and so on are actually just fairly irrelevant in, at, at that scale. Um, mm. And we are clearly just one big mix of, 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 of things and, and that works. I think that's, that's great.
Hmm. So I think public perception is important to know all these great advancements. It's not just the genetic sets advanced. We've had a pushback in our knowledge of the older stone tools. You know, we used to think it was kind of a million years and it was two and a half. Now it's, you know, 3.3 million years ago is the older stone tools that we know of. Hmm. And they're being made by human uh, ancestors that aren't part of our genus, potentially. You know, they're hmm. much older. So it gives us an insight into how these different human ancestors are actually clever, social, technologically aware, engaging, and also that our, our knowledge is incomplete. Mm. I think we need to be honest about that. You know, we are missing an organic record because it doesn't preserve mm -hmm. over these great expanses of time. Where we do have organic preservation and very lucky situations, a couple of sites, uh, a famous site in Germany called Schoningen, they have wooden spears and javelins, which are both thrusting close quarter hunting weapons as well as throwing weapons. Mm -hmm. And you know, they give us a great insight into how these non-human species, because they're still removed from us to about 400,000 or maybe 200,000, so our dating sort of changes as well as techniques advance. Um, but it gives us insight into these past human species that they are clever. Mm. And it's not just kind of us as modern humans are special and everyone else is, isn't really. I mm. think there is a very subtle continuum there. Of course, there are differences in morphology and things and, and shape and culture uh, and presumably language. But they are not so insurmountable that we don't, we, we don't see something attractive in them. <laughs> and, mm. and, that's, and, you know, the public need to understand, I think, that we, we, there's a danger perhaps in some things of dumbing this down, oversimplifying it. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that's not necessary. I think let's embrace the complexity and say, you know, look, we're a complicated species today. We're complicated in the past. It's not a case of us and them. It's a case of us all forming, you know, something that comes up together mm. uh, and forms us today. And I think people will appreciate that and they would, you know, embrace that degree of, of challenge. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's an interesting thing that there is, there is something sort of beautiful and almost liberating in, under, in I suppose, trying to understand or get your head around the idea that, that there's no one single attribute that makes us human and other creatures animals. You know? Yeah, um, I think that's but, right. Culture, tool use, even forms of linguistics these things are it, we, we are a very special combination but this stuff is this stuff has been been bubbling and is bubbling around as still today yeah yeah mm. okay um thank you for talking a little bit about what it is you do and also for, for satiating some of my uh, my curiosity there um but uh, i suppose now let's just move on to some of the questions which i tend to ask uh, everyone in these interviews um uh, first and foremost i guess I'm intrigued to know, what's the most satisfying thing uh, about being uh, an archaeologist for you or, or being involved in the study of, of, of humanity and its ancestry? Okay, I think if I'm allowed, I have two answers for that. Um, the, the first one uh, for me is when you're on field work, excavating, I, I mean, I work in, in East Africa, but I've also worked in Britain and, and in Europe. And I think mm -hmm. for me, there is still something fundamentally exciting and joyful when you uncover an artifact that maybe hasn't been held by another human hand for, you know, 200,000 years, half a million years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I may even been very fortunate enough to have uncovered, you know, something almost over a million years old in, in, in Kenya. And that for me is kind of, there is something powerful about that. You know, mm. the last time someone saw or engaged with this object was a different human who thought differently to me, who uh, saw the world around them as a very different place to the, to the same spot that I'm standing in and, and, and engaging with that artifact. And I, for me, that's incredibly exciting. I think that's mm. really genuinely uh, mind-blowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I only go back a meager 22,000. That's the oldest thing I've ever touched. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, so, and your second part, sorry? So the, the, so the second part then, I think, is then the, uh, the teaching of that experience, I think, to students. And mm. just sometimes just seeing the light bulb moment in their eyes when they kind of just really kind of begin to grasp the full wonder of, of what it is that we do and, and how we learn and, and what, you know, there's a lot of information we can tell from the various strands of our studies, whether it's stone tools, whether it's genetics, whether it's, you know, 
lots of different strands. Um, and they just, sometimes they just start pulling that together for themselves. And I, that light bulb moment I find immensely rewarding. It kind of, I uh, mm. hope it helps make a difference to them. I, they might have a different opinion on that, obviously. <laughs> but uh, uh, mm. I like to at least think it's kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll have to say. I mean, I suppose coming at it from the other side, you know, I've never, I've never, I've never taught this stuff in particular. I, I, I you know, I do lecture in other realms of archaeology, but, um, uh, but I, I did in my first year do um, do a human evolution module. Uh, as as I was at that point, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to be where I was going to be, basically, mm -hmm. terms, you know, and uh, and I there was a moment certainly for me when when there was that, that click. And and I think that there's some there is something very um, it's a service I think that that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that at its best that, that that can be provided just to just to say to someone you know by the way you know that, that not only is the world bigger but also actually you you know you can understand this 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 is within your realm of, of you know so um so I mean obviously you haven't taught me but I can say I've I've been I've been <laughs> on the receiving end of the click so um so that, that that's really good that's really good um okay so so uh, that. That's, that's great actually that's, that's, it's good to hear that that, that that you in that sense enjoy the the office as it were being in in uni you know um the next question which i ask everyone is is really it's a question about i guess the the, the future of archaeology and i don't and bearing in mind where it is that you work in different part on different parts of the globe this 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 answer may be very interesting um, but really what challenges are coming up on the horizon for, uh, in particular, for your your realm of archaeology. What 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 what's 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 coming along? Sure. Well, I mean, I think there's there's probably a, a couple. I mean, probably a very common one that you've heard is 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 the uh, challenge of actually getting the funding to go and, and and do the research. You know, quite rightly, we have to bid for funds to go out to you know what might be seen as exotic places to conduct this field work, and we have to make. A clear scientific justification for that work and it's a, it's a tender process and it's mm. peer-reviewed and it's graded you know I I think that is good and I think that you know make sure that you know you're, you're always trying to do the, the best possible science within that but it also is limiting in a fact that only there's only a certain amount of money and only and there's always going to be more projects than the money can fund so mm. um, I think the challenge there is actually trying to uh, engage maybe public interest a bit more in this, try and generate a bit more, I, I hate to, uh, it's not a, um, a, a campaigning call or anything, but kind of sort of try and generate a bit more, 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 more funds through these bodies to actually allow more of the science to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's always a challenge. But actually, I think more importantly than that, uh, so particularly where if, if you work um, abroad, and so in my instance, say, um, I do, we do work in Tanzania and we, have, we work very closely with colleagues there from the university, the National Museum, and we like to try and engage the local communities and get them involved in, 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 in the value of, of their own heritage. And, you know, I stress this isn't and shouldn't be seen as some kind of, you know, Western dominated viewpoint of going somewhere and going, well, you know, you guys need to see value in something. That that's not that's not it at all. But mm -hmm. it's actually it's engaging people in in who may not know actually the, the genuine antiquity of, of what they have on their door and their on their doorstep and mm. helping maybe in some small way um, see value in effectively what are lumps of rock on the ground mm. and how that can generate. Uh, you know, income for that area through tourism uh, and, and working, you know, with local initiatives, guides, national bodies and things like that so that everybody can kind of benefit from this. And I think that's an increasingly recognized, increasingly important part of archaeology. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't matter what period you're working in for that. Yeah. Um, you know, that engagement with the public um, is really important. And mm. we as scientists have to do better mm. at engaging that and explaining ourselves to mm. to to everybody else mm. um and i think that's a joy of our job and and you know we should embrace that as such mm. Mm. it's interesting that, that you mentioned this sort of what what in this country would be called impact in terms of research uh, but in a way which is not so uh, i suppose 
positivistic in its impact assessment. You know, that, uh, that is to say, you're not just talking in like a po post-colonial sense, but actually in a very real sense, how can this stuff being here be good for you? That, that, that's, that's a really, that's a really, uh, really reassuring thing to be hearing actually. Um, and not, not just, I suppose, not just being concerned about how you uh, re-empower re local academics, but also local people. In, in the archaeology that surrounds them. Um. Yeah, and I think that applies, you know, that's not just abroad. I mean, that's in our own communities here in, in Britain and, and Europe as well. Um, mm. You know, engage, increasing engagement with local uh, archaeological societies, mm. uh, what's being called sort of citizen science, I think is extremely powerful and extremely important. Mm. And, you know, we need to, you know, um, make ourselves accessible and, mm. you know, to to everybody to kind of engage with and um, uh, with this process. Okay, uh, well, the final question, I'm sure that you'll be, be relieved to hear the, the final ones are right, um, is actually to do with budding archaeologists. Now, and in, also in this instance, I guess, people who are, who are intrigued by human evolution. Um, what would your advice be to people who want to, uh, whether it be coming to study uh, as a mature or, or as a conventional student or even just people who just want to just know more um, what would your range of advice be for those people sure I well the first one that I, that I always said to my own students and I certainly tried to follow it in my own career was always follow what you're interested in because mm, mm. um, if you're interested in something one you'll really enjoy it and whatever you decide to do whether that's kind of a student going through a degree program to then get a job afterwards what if you do, if you stay true to what you're interested in, you will make it work because mm -hmm. you will enjoy it and you will engage. So always stay true to that. But also be open to the fact that your interests may change. Mm. Um, certainly for myself, I went to university thinking I want to be a maritime archaeologist. I can't think of anything better than kind of diving down and exploring a fantastic wreck and mm -hmm. recording, you know, the last moments of what happened there. And I was absolutely certain that that was what I was going to do. And then I think within four months of being at university, I completely changed my tune and thought, actually, I can't imagine anything other than human evolution. So always uh, be interested, but be, be willing to, to, to accept that actually those interests could change and expand as, as your experiences do. Mm. Um, so uh, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, if you're just kind of generally interested, there are so many fantastic resources available. Um, Lots of museums, including the Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. the British Museum, and things like the Smithsonian, have fantastic websites that really explain human evolution. They break it down by species in a very engaging way. Nice reconstructions, uh, you know, where are they found, uh, where are these species found, how do they relate to each other, and, you know, very, in a very easy and accessible manner. So it, there's always a lot out there to find on the magic of the internet. Mm. Cool. However... Uh, people do need to be slightly um, uh, discerning in their internet use because there are also a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, challenging websites out there which, which maybe <laughs> won't depict information as, as accurate as, as they could. No. So be careful in your choice of research, but it is, there is so much information at our fingertips now that we should embrace that and um, you know, we, can, we can find out a lot more. Mm. about what we do and if in doubt always uh, try and see if you can ask somebody <laughs> yeah actually and that, that was quite literally what i was just about to say actually uh, uh, you know would you encourage people to if they if they have a legitimate question to reach out and, and ask yes mm. I, I mean i i certainly uh, for myself i would encourage mm. people to 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 um to ask um I mean, my, my details, for example, are all over the university <laughs> website and things like that. So, uh, and I think I can speak for some colleagues here, you know, we always are genuinely happy to answer interested questions. Mm. The other key thing is, you know, look at your local ar archaeological societies. Mm -hmm. They often will have, you know, talk evenings, maybe once a month, maybe once every two weeks, where they'll invite people like myself to come and give talks. So there may well be programs there where you can actually meet people in person or, you know, listen to a talk which may answer some of your questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, okay, well, you, you've, you've answered my questions very, very, uh, very cogently there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and also, actually, as well, thank you for... for 
for for just giving us a bit of an insight into into uh, in particular this material culture element of of such such deep history uh, i think i think often people tend to think of material culture as being some again one of these key ingredients that, that only we do but it's so lovely to hear that actually that that, that, that this stuff has a deep history um so thank you for sharing that thank you no at um, all thank you for having me you're very welcome. You're welcome. It's, been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if any of you guys at home have any thoughts or comments or questions, do comment below on the video. Um, I can't promise that James will see them himself necessarily. Yeah, he's not going to be looking at his own video, hopefully, all the time. But <laughs> but if anything does turn up, I'll, I'll more than happily forward it on to him. Uh, and indeed, of course, as he says, his details are available if you have a, a question to email to him directly. So once again, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. And, uh, well, take care. That's great. Thanks, Mark, and you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.